All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, coming to this uh, uh, session. Uh, uh, so today we'll be talking about uh, auto vacuum and have possibly a detailed understanding of MVCC in Postgres and the internals of auto vacuum. Okay. Uh, 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 I'm not using a mirror display. Okay. That's fun. All right. So about me quickly, right? Uh, um, so uh, I live in Canada. Uh, I think some, some of you have uh, attended uh, um, uh, a tutorial uh, yesterday. Um, I mean, uh, on Postgres internals. Uh, and, uh, uh, and at the same time, I've also spoken at uh, lots of conferences in the past. And uh, um, also, uh, yeah, I, I have some background on Oracle and other databases too. So this way, if you ask any questions, I'm definitely not applying for a job. Uh, I'm only trying to say that I'm happy to talk about a different technology as well. Uh, and I've written a couple of books. Um, and I would honestly not recommend reading the beginning Postgres on cloud because I wrote that six years ago and it's outdated. And at the same time, Postgres 13 cookbook, yes, uh, it's still good for Postgres 14 or even upcoming Postgres 15 because uh, it's all about more than Postgres 13, about the open source ecosystem that can be used on top of Postgres. And at the same time, I'm also a co-founder and a CEO at uh, MigOps, Migrations to Open Source. MigOps means Migrations to Open Source predominantly Postgres. So we deal with, so if you have heard about a tool called ora 2 pg it's we who uh, 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 kind of uh, contribute to that. And at the same time, the CTO of MigOps is the author of ora 2 pg and PG Badger and uh, all such tools. And we offer Postgres trainings, support, etc. And I'm not gonna do more marketing about MigOps. Okay, so let me uh, uh, go through the topics that we are discussing today. So we are going to talk about undo management in Postgres, right? By the way, how many of you are really new to Postgres or someone who is uh, looking to migrate to Postgres? Okay, great, fine. So I could use some Postgres terms. Uh, uh, and uh, so we're gonna discuss about how ondo management works in Postgres and how, what are transaction IDs and some of the Postgres system columns and uh, how is it different from other relational databases? So why do we need auto vacuum? And Definitely about auto vacuum settings and a lot of internals of auto vacuum. And, uh, and at the same time, we'll also talk about uh, tuning auto vacuum as well in this. So in case uh, you have some experience with Oracle or MySQL in the past, you would have, note, uh, you would have looked at some errors such as ORA 0155, like snapshot too old, unable to extend segment by eight, and all of these crazy fancy errors in Oracle. Um, uh, or could be possible even in Postgres, but with different error codes maybe. Uh, I'm sorry, not Postgres, MySQL. Uh, but but the, the thing is, uh, in Oracle or MySQL or majority of the relational databases, you have undo storage separately. So undo is disconnected from the tables and undo is a separate area that's maintained in a separate could be a table space or a data file, right? So what it means is when you perform an update or a delete, right? Of course, update involves a delete and an insert. So when you perform a delete, the deleted record for consistency reasons, because we have acid, atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. So to satisfy the C in acid, right? What it means is, let's say there is another session that is already connected and running a statement which is relying on the tuple or the row that is currently being deleted. It should still be able to see that row, right? So whenever you're, you're reading as of a certain snapshot, right, as how the data is at that point of time, you know, you should make sure that that consistent stage is not lost. For that reason, the past image upon a delete, it's copied to undo storage in other relational databases, right? And when it's copied to undo storage, what is the challenge with other databases, right? The first thing is there is a separate write that's happening to undo, right? And in addition to that, you also may need to allocate certain space or storage 
to that undo area, right? And if you don't have enough storage for undo, what it means is, in Oracle at least, you have undo retention size and undo retention time. What it means is, if undo exceeded by a certain amount of size, then go ahead and clean up the past undo data. Similarly, undo retention time. If the amount of undo that's being stored is more than a certain amount of time, whatever the undo retention time is, let's say 900 seconds, any undo that's more than 900 seconds, take it away from the undo area. In such cases, you get snapshot to all. That means you're running a query which is trying to read a tuple as of a certain time, and that does not exist in undo anymore. So, sorry, your query is not successful. That used to be the error in Oracle. So now, talking about Postgres, the difference, the biggest difference that you see with MVCC in Postgres is, Postgres maintains undo within the same table itself, right? If a table got updated, which means a delete is happening in the backend and an insert, or if one of the record is deleted, the record that got deleted is still retained in the same table as what we call as an older version. What is an older version, the term behind that, we'll definitely talk about it. So in order to, you know, approach, in, in order to get to this approach, we leverage transaction IDs. So we'll be discussing about transaction IDs. And at the same time, because now we are maintaining these older versions within the same table, we need to make sure that there is a background process that exists to delete the older versions, right? At the same time, the advantage is, of course, there are no special, um, uh, you know, writes that are happening or locks that are happening. So what is MVCC, multi-version concurrency control, which is applicable for every database, not just Postgres, right? So it's to avoid viewing inconsistent data and also, you know, make sure that um, uh, like, you know, like the readers and writers do not block each other. And all these mechanisms um, are implemented in a variety of way in, in, when, when you talk about Postgres comparing to other database. So we'll, we'll discuss um, um, about that very shortly. You would not be understanding this statement if you are not aware of MVCC in Postgres today, but by the end of the slides, yes, you should be able to, or presentation, yeah. So, so when you run a select, it appears as if you are re reading the data with a certain condition, like x min less than or equal to current transaction, and x max equal to zero, or tx id less than x max. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. What are transaction IDs in Postgres? So we need to first start with transaction ID, right? So what we are discussing so far, or what we discussed until now is, we have undo being maintained within the same table itself as older versions upon a delete. So I think that's good for now. So let's understand transaction IDs. Each transaction is allocated a transaction ID, which is pretty simple to understand. But up to what limit can the transaction IDs go, right? So a transaction ID in Postgres is a circular 32-bit unsigned integer. It's a circular buffer. So what, what, what happens is it starts from 0, and it's a 32-bit unsigned integer. What it means is it goes up to 2 to the power of 32 minus 1. So it goes from 0 until 4.2 some billion, right? 4.2 billion. And again, it starts back from 0. Remember this for now, but you will not get it at the moment. It's actually 4.2 billion, and 2.1 transaction IDs in the past are visible. 2.1 billion transaction IDs in the future are not visible because it's future. For now, for now, all that you need to understand is transaction ID counter starts from zero, goes until 4.2 billion, restarts from zero. 0, 1, and 2 are reserved transaction IDs, right? 0, 1, and 2 are reserved transaction IDs. And we discussed transaction ID is circular. So it just appears like this, right? A circle, but we'll get to that. So now let's talk about system columns in Postgres. 
what happens when you create a table? So in this example, we are talking about a table with columns that contain only ID and name, right? The last two tuples or rows that you see, ID, integer, name, character varying, those are the only two columns that are assigned to this cod.emp table. But you see six additional columns. So they are the system columns. So by default, you have a heap table header, uh, header data structure, right, which is storing certain information about that tuple. Tuple is nothing but a row, right? So that is what we see as the system columns. So to understand how the older versions are being maintained, how vacuum has to clean them up, and what is visible to us and what is not visible, we need to understand two of these system columns, which is xmin and xmax. So what is xmin? The xmin column is, you know, generally it stores the transaction ID that inserted the specific tuple, and xmax column show, uh, uh, stores, or the attribute stores, the transaction that issued an update or a delete on this tuple. Let's see this slide to understand it better. So xmin and xmax are our, uh, you know, are, are, the, are the true points of observation in this uh, slide now. So if you create a table, scott.employee with two columns, ID and name, when you do a select star from employee, you only see those two columns, right? So what I did was, I tried to find the current transaction ID, which is 516, and I ran using the next transaction ID an insert statement, which is inserting 10 records using a generate series. And then, this time, the system columns xmin and xmax, which exists for every row, it's hidden unless you explicitly select them, right? So I'm explicitly selecting the xmin, xmax, along with ID and name. Because I used 517, which is after 516, the next transaction ID, 517 transaction ID to insert all the 10 rows, xmin got assigned as 517 for each row. In case I did another insert, this time there could have been some other rows with 518 as the xmin set to them. For now, you understood xmin, right? And xmax is zero because there is no such transaction that issued a delete or an update yet. In Postgres, I think, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just quickly talk about it. In Postgres, you can have some external code attached to Postgres, which is easily maintainable and is not tightly coupled with the Postgres source code, right, which is and, and that's what we call as extensions, right? So there is an extension called PG free space map. What this extension does is it uses the free space map, right, to identify, right, identify how much of free space is available in a page. So PG free space map tells us if there is a table, we inserted 10 records. Where are the records being inserted? Internally, it is pages or what we call as data blocks. And these data blocks or pages are of size 8 kilobyte each by default, unless you modify it. So these 10 tuples that we inserted in the previous slide, right, they got inserted to the page 0 because page number starts from 0. And there is enough free space in it because it's not a huge um, uh, uh, it, it was not really taking so many bytes in order to store so much of data. So if you see the current free space using the PG free space map function because we created the extension, so we are now able to run this PG free space function. So what we are trying to do is in scott.employee table, right, for each block, how much of free space is available? Because we only inserted 10 records, the first block is only visible, and it has got 94% of free space. Just remember that for now. Again, right, so what we've seen so far is, we discussed about, you know, uh, uh, undo being stored in the same table. We discussed about even the 
Uh, transaction IDs has a 32-bit unsigned integer, 0 to 4.2 billion. Reserved transaction IDs has 0, 1, 2. And we discussed about system columns that are automatically added to every table. And we discussed about Xmin, right? And free, free space map, of course. So let's delete a record now and see what happens. I have two parallel sessions, session one and session two, where I'm going to go ahead and run a delete from scott.employee where id equal to nine. So I'm just running a delete on one record. I'm deleting only one record here. And the transaction id that I use to delete this is 520. In another session, I ran a select of xmin xmax id name. This appears now as 520. So the xmax got updated with the transaction ID that issued the delete, right? But the thing is, this delete is not committed yet. That is why you're still seeing that row there, right? If the delete would have been committed, the default isolation level is read committed. So what it means is it would have automatically, you know, not shown us that tuple there. Let's commit the delete now, and automatically the number of rows in the output gets reduced to nine rows. However, we discussed that once a tuple or a row is deleted, it's stored within the same table, but as a different version, right? In order to see that, let's use another extension called page inspect. So page inspect is an extension which can be used to see what's inside a page, nothing but a data block. So let's use this extension which exposes two functions, right? Like a get raw page and heap page item attributes. So we will use this extension, we'll just say create extension page inspect. And we will go ahead and see, you know, what's inside the block zero, scott.employee comma zero, right, using the uh, function uh, call. So I'm only printing the xpin and xmax, not the data. Actually, you could also print the data. So I see 517 xmin and 520 xmax existing there. It's actually 10 rows, not nine rows. And if I go ahead and print what's in the line item pointer nine, with CTID 0, 0,9. What is CTID? It's another system column similar to xmin and xmax that stores the tuple's position, which means block number, comma, the line item pointer or the item pointer, right? So we have xmin and xmax set there, and it says that xmax is committed. This hint bit is set to true. What it means is there is an xmax assigned to a tuple and it's committed. That means that is already a deleted tuple, right? And when is this committed? It's committed by transaction ID 520. So if there is anything between these transactions that are still trying to read the snapshot before 520, this row is still visible. Where does it say deleted? Sorry? That's what is xmax and xmax is committed. So, what was that, sorry? So when you say xmax is updated, right? I mean, uh, when, when you say even if it's, if, uh, even in the case of an update, um, uh, you know, you, you would see that. But the, but the thing that we need to understand is what is an update? An update does a delete and an insert, right? What you see this entry is for the deleted tuple. So there'll be a new row that's inserted with xmin set to the transaction ID that issued the update, which is 520. In case it would have been not a delete, but an update, there'll be a, an, a new tuple with xmin set to 520 and xmax set to zero. That's because it's an update which involves a delete and an insert. It, it cannot be both non-zero, right? I mean, yeah, it can be both non-zero, it must be, yeah, yeah, correct. I mean, xmax should be zero, or there will also be a case where xmax can be non-zero. 
what it means is, let's delete a, roll, a rec record and roll back. Come on, okay. So what I did here is, I said delete from scott.employee where ID equal to six. And who issued that delete? The transaction ID 522, right? Upon the next select, right, it's actually updating the hint bit. Anyways, we'll not talk about that here. So now if you see the line pointer, or the item pointer six, it says xmax is set to it, but xmax rollback is set to true. The committed is false. That means there is an xmax, but it doesn't mean that the tuple is deleted. It means that there is a commit that has been set with a Boolean false, but the rollback is set, the hint bit is set to true. It means ignore even if there is an xmax to it when you're reading the tuple. So this xmin and xmax together with the hint bits set to each heap tuple plays a major role in determining whether my current transaction ID can see that row or not. Or my current transaction ID has to see which row based on the snapshot I'm requesting. So xmin and xmax play a major role in understanding you know, what is visible to a transaction. So, the, so there is a current transaction, so my current transaction ID or the transaction ID that is actually trying to read the data, right? So, yeah. yeah. Now, what about the space occupied by the deleted tuple? Now, for example, we discussed that the delete is performed and it's committed. Even in the case of an update, an update triggers both delete and insert. So instead of 10 rows, you see 11 rows now in the page. Is that, is that point clear? Because instead of a delete, let's say you got 10 rows and you issued an update. An update is doing a delete and an insert. And delete is not really deleting this tuple, but it's just setting the xmax to the transaction ID that issued the delete and it's setting the hint bit, xmax is committed to true, and it's doing a new insert with xmin set to the xmax of the previous deleted transaction. It's tricky, but I hope you got it, right? It's hard to put on a slide too. I think, yeah, okay. All right, so, so now let's talk about vacuum or auto vacuum. Mm -hmm. That is because of you know the approach that we are talking about the MVCC design altogether, right? MVCC doesn't just say you have to use it. Okay. MVCC exists with any database. I mean, th it, it, it's not about that, but the design that we chose around you know like um, how do we determine or how do we handle undo, right? For read consistency. So the design that we took is to handle that through transaction IDs and store them in the same table. So if you rather want to do an update, it doesn't work with this current storage engine. So there are, I mean, there are some projects in the past to, you know, I mean, we still can have pluggable storage engines with Postgres, right? You, I mean, there are people who worked on, I think, Zheap, uh, uh, you know, such certain storage engines which replicates such a behavior where you update and it just updates there. But what about the previous state of that row? If you say that an update has to update it. Then you're talking about delete and insert, isn't it? No, it's not deleted. Okay, so, we can take offline. Yeah, 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 okay. I, I, Then, okay, so, so again, just, just to make it clear for everybody, right? So when we are discussing an update, 
we are trying to say that the existing record is getting its xmax modified with hint bit xmax committed set to true and a new row being inserted is that clear that's how you implement what yes Uh, there are there are some works on different storage engines where you want to, to do it that way. Yeah, you need a separate undo in that case where this record, the old deleted record, has to go somewhere. So uh, yeah, we can talk about storage engines separately. Um, yeah, now let's talk about auto vacuum, right? So now what we were talking about is upon an update or a delete, you know, there is an xmax set to it, and that xmax is committed. So such a record is treated as a dead tuple, an older version. Whereas the tuples that are just inserted, not updated, deleted, of course, with only x min set to them, are the live tuples. And when you have continuous activity happening on the database, such as updates and deletes, you'll have lots of dead tuples being generated, right? And when such dead tuples are generated, because, you know, we were just talking about an update or delete still persisting that row as an older version. Talk about a database with heavy traffic that issues a lots of updates. So I was working with one customer um, who is related to food delivery, right? And uh, the delivery status is always updated every 30 seconds. Uh, when the driver picks it up and, you know, goes to a certain location, where is he currently, how, you know, how far has he made it, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So when such update in intensive databases exist, you may see lots and lots of dead tuples being generated. In such a case, you know, how do you deal with it? We'll talk about that, but such older versions can be cleaned up by what we call as vacuum. It's, it's not, of course, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now talking about uh, um, the auto vacuum, auto vacuum automatically picks up what tables have to be uh, uh, in the process of, you know, vacuum. So there is an auto vacuum launcher process, we'll quickly talk about that. So now after we running vacuum on scott.employee, you see that this tuple that exists in line item pointer nine, like with 0, 0,9 as CTID, that's gone. <coughs> Excuse me. But it doesn't mean that that space is gone, right? Now if you see the free space after vacuum, it increased to 95% from 94% because one record is deleted. So that can be reused by another tuple in the future. So quickly we'll talk about transaction ID wraparound. Now you talk, now you understood the requirement uh, or the reason why we need vacuum or auto vacuum. However, uh, sorry, uh, quick question. And when they vacuum, do they compact the space or do they just leave it? There? Good question. So when you, when you run a vacuum, it's only cleaning up that space, but it is actually not, um, uh, you know, uh, shrinking the page. No, it doesn't do such reordering or shifting or the future inserts yeah. can utilize this. If future insert is greater than the space you just uh, clean out, what happens to that? In that case, you need to talk about toast. Toast in Postgres, where if you say that you have, you know, a, a row with greater than two kilobytes in size, which is the default size set to it, oh. the row gets truncated until then and the remaining space will be uh, remaining part of the row is stored in a compressed storage called toast. Like a fixed max size, so you can yes, a page, I mean, in any, in any database, page doesn't get extended. So there'll be row chaining that could happen to a new page in other databases, but yeah, that's right. Okay, so let's quickly talk about transaction ID wraparound. So what is transaction ID wraparound? Let's consider my current transaction ID, which is N. Let's consider N as 100 here. So using Transaction ID 100, 
I inserted a tuple. That means the x min of the tuple is 100, x max is 0. Okay? Please understand this ex example or else it will not be clear. After certain time, it's a very busy database, we are at a transaction ID 2.1 billion plus n, which is 2.1 billion plus 100. This transaction ID issuing a select can see tuples with x min up to n. What it means is the distance or the difference between the current transaction ID and the least of the x min cannot be more than 2.1 billion. <coughs> that is what we are trying to say as 2.1 transaction IDs in the past are visible right and if your current transaction id is 2.1 billion plus n plus 1 where the difference is more than that when i say 2.1 billion it's exactly not 2.22 comma uh, 100 comma tw not 2100 million there is a number because it's half of 2, pa 2 to the power 32 minus 1 so what happens is now as per the um, uh, you know, back end logic, the tuple that got inserted with x min as n is now its future. It's no more its past. So it cannot see that tuple anymore. So that stage, if it reaches any time, it's called as transaction ID wrap around in Postgres. Of course, it doesn't happen at all because Postgres would start stopping your write traffic when you have only 1 million transaction IDs left before reaching such a stage. Now, what should we be doing in such a case? It's important to freeze the tuples. If you remember, I was talking about reserved transaction IDs 0, 1, and 2. So, until Postgres 11, I think, right, it used to assign, so when a vacuum runs, if it's touching the page, that contains the tuples that needs to be frozen with a lot of x min, x min more than a certain value, right? I mean, from the, I mean, if the distance between the current transaction ID and the x min, the least of the x min, is more than a certain value, then vacuum automatically freezes the x min to two, the number two. So this way, what we are talking about transaction ID wraparound here, it's no more applicable to the frozen tuple, right? That tuple is live and its x min is updated. But in the newer versions, what it's actually doing is it is going ahead and setting the hint bit in the back end, x min frozen to true. So this way, you know, there is not a special write that's happening, but it's still freezing the tuple. So it's part of vacuum. So if you would have run vacuum freeze, it's actually doing the freezing as well. Now, yeah, it's until 9.3, yes. From 9.4, the x-min frozen is set to uh, true, yeah. Now, okay, so let's talk about quickly, like uh, when does an auto vacuum run? Of course, for auto vacuum to run, you need to have it set to on. And there is a background process called starts stats collector which tracks the information about how many inserts, updates, and deletes are happening to every table. And Postgres identifies, or the auto vacuum launcher, uh, uh, you know, is going to get the information about what tables need to be part of vacuum or analyze. And there'll be auto vacuum worker processes that will be start to run vacuum on those tables, right? So these two important parameters must always be set to on. They are on by default. I would recommend not changing them any time. Now let's understand quickly the mathematical representation of, uh, or the condition that has to reach, right? So when does a vacuum run on a table? Or when is a table qualified for an auto vacuum vacuum? When? The number of updates and deletes on the table, because as you understand, vacuum is about cleaning the dead tuples. So dead tuples are only generated when updates and deletes happen, right? So when auto vacuum, I mean, when the number of updates and deletes on a table are equal to the auto vacuum vacuum scale factor 
times number of tuples plus vacuum threshold. It confuses like my face. Let's get to the next slide and make it easy for everyone, right? If, if you look at the auto vacuum vacuum scale factor or the analyze scale factor by default, they are set as 0 0.2 or 0 0.1 by default in certain versions. Now, let's try to retrieve or substitute the values and see what it derives. Consider a table called foo.bar with 1,000 records. When does a vacuum run? A vacuum runs when the number of updates and deletes is equal to 0 0.2 times 1,000 plus 50. That means if there are 250 updates and deletes on a table with 1,000 records, then you see it becoming a candidate for vacuum. Similarly, if there are 0 0.1 times 1,000 plus 50, which is if there are 150 inserts plus updates plus deletes, then the table becomes a candidate for auto vacuum analyze. What is analyze? Analyze is a job to update the statistics which, which helps the optimizer choose the correct execution plans. Now let's talk about tuning auto vacuum, right? So how do we tune auto vacuum? So consider two tables with not just 10 records, even 1,000 records versus a million records. So with the current formula, what really happens is if you have a table with 1,000 records, we discussed that it'll be 250 rows that would be needed as updates or deletes in order to make that table get vacuumed. But if it's a million record table, then it requires 200,000 rows to be updated or deleted. That means the frequency at which a large table gets vacuumed is lesser with the default formula. In such a case, you could set table level auto vacuum settings to let the auto vacuum run more frequently for larger tables through different settings, like setting vacuum threshold to maybe 10,000, setting scale factor to zero. That means every 10,000 updates or deletes, vacuum runs. Similar is the case with analyze. And there are a maximum of three auto vacuum max workers, right? So. Um, it's not that you can have as many tables being vacuumed at the same time. But what if you want to go ahead and increase the number of workers to more than three because you want all your tables to be vacuumed immediately? In that case, you need to understand if vacuum is I.O. intensive. If, what is auto vacuum doing? It is actually reading, right? It's reading pages from disk to memory, and then it is updating those pages by deleting the older versions. So it's playing with eight kilobyte blocks. So let's translate that to the I.O. needed. So the amount of read I.O. or write I.O. is what we need to understand. So these are some of the backend parameters that play important role in uh, declaring how much work can be done by all vacuums together. So there is a cost limit. Cost limit by default is set to 200. So it, any time vacuums together, all vacuums together, could reach up to a cost of 200 units. And if it reaches that cost limit, it will sleep for cost delay amount of time. And the cost of reading a page an 8KB page that contains dead tuples from memory, if it's already in memory, shared buffers, it's one unit. Each page is one unit. And if it's not in memory, cost of reading it from disk or OS cache is page miss, which is generally set as 10 units. And if it is now in memory, the cost of updating it so that the dead tuples are deleted is cost page dirty, right? To generate a dirty buffer, it's 20 units by default. I've written all of that. So with all these settings in place, what do you think could happen in one second, right? Yeah, a lot of things. But here, one second equal to 1,000 milliseconds. In a best case scenario where it is doing all its job in no time, right? It could reach the cost limit of 200 units 50 times because Every time it reaches, it sleeps for 20 milliseconds. How many times can it sleep? 
1,000 divided by 20, so 50 times. So 50 times 200 units of work is being performed, right? It means if vacuum has to read, it can read 50 times 200 by, if it's reading from memory, cost page hit times 8 kilobyte pages, because per each page it's one unit. So it can read, all vacuums together can read up to 78 megabytes per second, per second. Because one second, 1,000 milliseconds, that's how we derived it. It's a best case scenario, right? And if in case it needs to read from disk when not found in memory or OS cache, divided by cost page miss is 10 units, so it's 7.81 megabytes per second. Similarly, if it found that page and now has to update that page, it is divided by 20, so it's 3.9 megabytes per second. So what it means is all vacuums together are only able to do so much amount of, time, amount of work. If you add more workers, they are sharing these limits, right? These are best case scenario, it's much more lesser than that. So you need to play with cost units as well as the workers. And at the same time, we discussed about the transaction ID wraparound where the age, age is nothing but the difference between the distance between the current transaction ID and the least of the X-men, right, of a table. So we need to make sure that we monitor that age or else consider this scenario where the highest database age is 2.1 billion. It's about to reach the vacuum, uh, a wraparound, which is 2.1 billion, 2.1 something. Immediately you need to identify which table has got the highest age and you need to run a vacuum. If not, I mean Postgres by default starts vacuuming at 200 million. A wraparound vacuum happens. Wraparound vacuum is dangerous because it acquires locks on pages aggressively and scans every page of the table until Postgres 13. But from Postgres 14, it's not scanning every page. It's only, it's, it's uh, scanning the required pages. And uh, when 11, uh -huh. I mean, auto vacuum vacuum does not generally do that. A wraparound vacuum would do that. An auto vacuum vacuum as well has to lock a page, but it gives itself a least priority if some other activity is happening. Yeah, that's why I said it has to lock. Has to lock. Yeah, so uh, auto vacuum vacuum also locks, yeah. but it gives itself a least priority. But our wraparound vacuum will not give itself a least priority, but it scans every page. From Postgres 14, that's what I would say, migrate to Postgres 14, it skips the inessential pages and only considers the pages that needs to be frozen, that, that has tuples need to be frozen. If you have just 11 million more transaction IDs left before a wraparound, then it would start showing hints and warnings. When you have one million transaction IDs left before the wraparound, it stops writes. And then you need to open the database in a single user mode and yeah. So best strategy is to make sure that you monitor the age, tune the IO settings to make vacuum really fast and robust, right? And at the same time, make sure that you monitor the dead tuples in your database. And then also, most of the performance issues are lack of, you know, due to the lack of parameter tuning or lack of understanding of the parameters. So never disable auto vacuum, and uh, also do not just set tables to unlock just to avoid wall writes because you don't, you would, you would lose those, you know, the data that's written to unlock tables, especially, uh, you know, uh, you will not see it replicated, no crash recovery, and. Uh, also play smartly with session level settings. Anyways, so that's everything. I'm open for questions. Uh, so uh, yeah, so even any, po be it Postgres on RDS or Aurora, you still have to deal with vacuum tuning or auto vacuum tuning, right? And at the same time, when you run a vacuum freeze or vacuum is performing some activity, if you consider Aurora, it's still writing and reading these blocks. So you still have some IO costs being accumulated because of these. So you need to have a proper vacuum tuning or else you will also be paying for IOPS on Aurora. 
right, which is again another hidden cost. Even on RDS, you still have the same behavior with vacuum or auto vacuum. So it's even on DBAS, but the only curiosity for anyone, any time would be, how do you deal with a database that has got into a transaction ID wraparound stage where you only have one million transaction IDs left and you cannot just run a vacuum. In order to run a vacuum, you have to separately connect to the server and open the database in a single user mode. You cannot do that with RDS or Aurora. I don't know, need to, need to try that. Absolutely, and monitoring the age as well as the data pools, especially the age. Okay. So you're talking about oh, okay, the age of database, right? Yeah. So you you should use similar queries to see what tables are getting to that. Is this getting to such an age because? Proper vacuum is not vacuuming is not happening because vacuum also takes care of freezing the tuples, but it only freezes those tuples that can, that is part of the pages that vacuum is vacuuming, right? So uh, if the pages do not contain any dead tuples, the pages are not touched by vacuum or a vacuum vacuum. In such a case, what happens is those pages, you know may contain stuples with x mins that needs to be frozen, but it never freezes them. Be you know? Can you touch on the freezing concept again? I didn't quite get that. So freezing means you, you have x min set, right? Okay, so the x min will be frozen to a frozen transaction ID. So it does not consider that record for calculating the age anymore. Uh, 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 trans to avoid transaction ID wraparound, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, if, if you lose some context, it's tricky to understand, but good that the session is recorded. So you, you could read, you know, go through that again. Yes, you're right. And for that reason, you need to look at the concept of hot updates. What it means is, if the data that got updated, especially, let's say there is no index on that uh, updated column, but index exists for the rest of the columns. In that case, if you have free space within the same page, there can be a hot update, an update which inserts the tuple upon delete to the same page, so there is a link between old to new. So the index tuple pointer need not change, so there are no index writes, or else you'll also have dead tuples in indexes too. So indexes also will be vacuumed automatically. Yeah, you good? Any other questions? You could stop. Okay, thank you. Thank you all.